see some movement at the takeoff zone. It's Kelly Slater grabbing. Right. Yeah, guy. Yeah, guy, David. Yeah, friggin' guy. Do you know what I'm talking about, David, when I say yeah, guy? Yeah, I know. When you get spit out of a barrel like that and you say, yeah, guy, and you break the internet with your Instagram clip. Uh, I wasn't really going there. What I was going to suggest to you, if I can real quick, is let the listeners know that I have teamed up with Wayne Rich and Surf Tech. We're giving away a Wayne Rich longboard, the wild card three. So all you got to do is go to surftech.com and right there on the page, it'll say enter to win a Wayne Rich longboard. You click on it, fill out the stuff. So I'm giving away, we are giving away a Wayne Rich, a Surf Tech. Now, this board, the wild card three, it has the NFT construction, which is an EPS foam paired with flax glass. So it's light. It's not too light. It's actually like the perfect amount of low vibration dampening. It's good for a log. So uh, to win a Wayne Rich longboard, simply go to surftech.com and enter to win. Yeah, guy. Yeah, guy. Um, so your Instagram clip broke the internet, dude. No. Yeah, it did. People are freaking loving it. Um, everybody wants to know. There's so much that fodder in the comments section there. Uh, between your, uh, you know, surfing at a top level at your, we're not going to say later age, but let's say, say past your prime, maybe. Oh, it's the AG1 is what he's showing Se me. AG1 secret sauce. The drinkag1.com slash surf is what he's showing me. Um, but the it is definitely the secret sauce. But then also all the people burning you, which is just commonplace nowadays. And then people want to know what you're riding. What's your board fin combo? So let's just start with the barrel itself. There's multiple clips or mul yeah, multiple waves in that little Instagram clip. But it starts out with you getting a proper barrel for Southern California. Is that the best barrel you've gotten in some time? Yeah. Actually, it is. It probably is the best barrel I've gotten in a long time, probably since my trip to Indo last July. It's yeah. epic that somebody caught it on video. I know. Um, that nice gentleman, Harry, he he does a lot. He's, he captures a lot of the local surfing in this region. Um, he's often down at Seaside. He get, He's really good at getting all the up-and-coming hot young guys at Seaside. And there's a lot of older blokes at seaside that he shoots too like rob machado and jason shook i see a, an adam Troutman. there's a lot of guys walt pasnowski a lot of guys my age that he shoots photos of he shoots well, that's what's cool about the local photographer right he like shoots everybody he doesn't mm -hmm. just focus on the super hot young kid so yeah hats off to harry martin for shooting the great footage so it was an epic wave. First of all, when you're paddling in, you can see that is maybe the wave. I mean, I don't know day, what the day looked like other than that, but it looks like the wave of the day. And then we've all been in that situation where you feel that level of pressure when the wave of the day is coming to you. And I got to say, you handled it like an uh, experienced, seasoned professional. Casual did exactly what you were supposed to do. You weren't over you know excited about it you just did it you surfed the thing perfectly yeah thank you yeah it was a fun super fun day of surfing and um it was just a beautiful day you know it was it was um it was good it was really crowded early on and i didn't go out i was in that oh, i'm not going out there there was like 45 50 dudes on it and i was like oh, i'm just gonna wait and you know how hard that is i know mm -hmm. you do when you've got like four hours to wait <laughs> You know, because I'm like, I'm waiting for the low tide. I'm just going to wait. I I know at a certain point of in the morning, people are going to leave. Like that whole crew is out. And um, sure enough, they left and it, it kind of turned into, it went from, you know, 50 to 20 people, which is manageable. And yeah. Um, and then the guy, to be fair, the guy in the clip that cuts me off, that was probably his wave. Mm. I, I didn't know who the guy was. And I guess you could say that I snaked him. Oh, I <laughs> We see. were both sitting out there, but it was his turn for sure. But I don't know who he is. I, I'd never seen him before. And so out there, when the waves are that good, I just turn and start paddling. And I'm expecting maybe the guy will just back out. You know, exactly. Yeah. And because until I know who you are, I, you know, so it was his wave. 
And so um, nobody should be kind of heckling him. And I did my best to stay out of his way, you know. And um, is that the one where you try to pull up into the tube? Yeah. Behind yeah. him? Yeah. Um, and there was another one that, another guy that burns you too. Off yeah, on I don't shoulder. know. That, that like guy some was younger just, guy? Yeah, just some shoulder hopper guy. And I was, whatever, you know. The, the bottom line is, is that there's plenty of room on that wave for two people generally, especially with me, because I kind of know, know how to get around people. It's just, It's a soft wave. It's not it's an easy way for two people. And, and also, um, I'm of the mindset, like, Hey, you know what, if you want to burn me, burn me on some karmic level, I might deserve it. And so it's all good. Like I'm sort of old enough now where I kind of don't, I try not to hold grudges about it. I try not to, I try to be more like, Hey, you know what? No worries. It's all good. Yeah. Well, um, I don't, that is the norm. Like that little clip summed up a session, any given session in Southern California, where maybe you get a good set wave at some point, but then you're also going to get burned a couple of times. Sometimes it's your fault. Or sometimes, like you said, you just were trying to power somebody out of their position and they didn't, they decided not to back down, but then there is going to be somebody that shoulder hops you. That is the absolute average session in Southern California nowadays, post COVID. Etiquette's out the window, basically. Yeah. Yeah. But there was a lot of, there was a lot of good, um, a lot of good etiquette happening too, you know? Um, and well, it's just, yeah, it, well, it's an interesting thing, right? The psychology of lineups in Southern California. It's a fascinating thing. It's more complicated now than ever. Um, Ford and Finn combo. What were you writing? Everybody wants to buy one now. Yeah, well they should. Cause I was writing one of my all time favorite surfboards, which is the, Ryan Sakel Saber, which you and I have spoken about numerous times on this show. So Ryan Sakel ships me a bunch of boards. He's making me a Twinser now. And um, it's a 610 twin fin with the C drive, the Naked Vikings NVS C drive fins, which is that sort of a, a keel fin template, but with the or sort of the top half of the keel fin cut out. So it forms kind of a C. So it's the C-drive fin. It's all the base of a keel with all the tip of a normal twin finny kind of MR twin fin. So some of the some of the areas cut out of it. So those are the C-drive fins. And then that 610, it's pretty full, pretty wide. And um, it paddles, you know, like a 7.6. And it gets me around, you know, and I, I'm a big fan of that board. It's easy to ride and it kind of just does what I want it to do without me having to think too much. Uh it is the perfect combination of doing what you want to do. Like, I almost want to say, oh, the board did the work, except you were doing half the work as well, but it did it effortlessly. You know, like I said, the way that you take off on that wave, there's no major pump. There's no major uh, body movement. It's just perfect glide positioned excellently, pulled up right into the midsection of the wave, got shacked, came out, didn't celebrate too hard. The turns are just effortless. So it's the perfect combination of surfer board and fin combo. So yeah, the board has an amazing, it has an amazing way of having me hold back my claims. So I do give credit <laughs> to the board for that. <laughs> well, it has an amazing way of like, um, there is a restraint in it. You know what I mean? Like it won't let you over express a turn, you know, it was just like, perfect glide and positioning on all of it so you know there's one wave in that where um i sort of go up high and i sort of have this like torn martin kind of moment you know <laughs> and everyone goes oh i really like that you know i talked to some guys at the board so i go, oh, that was really that was a really cool ride the way you did that or whatever and the fact of the matter is i fully farmed that like you can't tell but I, I tell. was my feet were i was out of position like i thought i was going to go out the back of the way yeah, I, I was like, oh, my God, I, I, I just wasn't in the right mojo. And somehow the board just set the rail and everything like it almost looked as if I was doing that on purpose. But I was really at the very close moment of just like shooting the board out of the wave. That's where you have to say at the um, editor on the back, because it leading into that moment, you could see that you're out of sorts and like you are projecting up and you're going to go out the back of the wave, but you do recover in that last moment right under the curl. And 
you put you do this pose it is only for a split second but he pauses it and snaps the screenshot in that split second so it almost makes it look as if everything was set up for that moment and it wasn't it was a recovery totally. but but Total yeah recovery. that's where the board and the fins absolutely help but anyways those c drives we've hyped for a couple of years now i can't yeah. yeah say enough good things about them especially the twin version of them i think that's where i've had my best experience with the c drives but naked viking is nvs you can get them at surfnvs.com um their instagram is naked viking surf i believe but yeah you see them everywhere nowadays and they do they do collaboration projects with a lot of different shapers so nvs yeah and those c drives you know they're they're odd looking fins so i think most surfers being conservative in nature tend to look at them and go uh those look a little maybe gimmicky or whatever but i promise you i wouldn't ride them if they didn't work incredible and they do and i as you know david i've had those in that particular board for about four seasons now so yeah it's that's my go-to setup yeah basically like you said the base is real wide so you get drive and then the the rake beyond that is a real kind of um a c-shaped rake and so you get the maneuverability of the water flowing through that c but the tip being strong because they're made out of the g10 laminate so that the tip remains real strong even though there's little material up there and uh, so drive and maneuverability it's ideal makes perfect sense actually yeah and, and check out Sakel, go to sit ryan Sakel's uh, instagram or check out his website that board is a pu construction and um it's my third or no, my second one of those boards, the Sabres. And you can get those at Real Water Sports, I believe, too. Yeah, that's right. I think you can. I've seen it hanging on the wall there. Um, well, hey, dude, we had a massive day of professional surfing yesterday. We did. Oh, my. The Hurley Pro at Sunset Beach. Absolutely buttery. Uh, five to eight foot surf. Just flawless. Not a not a uh, drop out of place, so to speak, to use the cliche. And and what a fun day of surf. I got to say, I was, when I was watching it yesterday, I was going, you know, tip of the cap to the WSL, frankly, or tip oh, of the yeah. cap to Mother Nature, because both events have been fun to watch. I've been fully engaged. I'm very engaged in the season now. And in some respects, because Felipe's not in the, the mix, it's, it's actually made it even better, believe it or not, to remove the world champion has made it better. And that's an interesting thought experiment in and of itself well i agree with you in that i feel like this is the best opening to a wsl season that i remember in recent history and we always you always say the waves are the stars that is 100 percent true none of this would be possible without these two venues firing yet beyond that the women are the stars the women have this is the year that the women have become the more interesting storylines throughout the event than the men and it's not just one it's a it's multiples and i think that's what makes it interesting going into this season i would not have necessarily told you to watch out for betty lou sakura johnson you know what i mean molly picklam of course you and i discussed last show she deserved our attention we had not given it to her prior but she's come out and been in two finals um she won this event we didn't state that yet and so and then you got caitlin simmers caitlin simmers winning the first event and her kind of bravado and brute you know power surfing strength that she's delivering and her personality that she's delivering all of this stuff is really um going head to head like it's almost like they're all coming to their peak performance at the same time and so they're being put into really good conditions and they're stepping up and delivering in those conditions. And that's, it's an incredible moment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And one of the things that I've been thinking about is, you know, you and I, and a lot of, a lot of people are like, you know what, the finals at lowers, okay, we did it. It was okay, but let's move the finals at lowers to waves of consequence. Let's move the final day to really incredible surf. And I think more than more so perhaps uh, then for the men, for the women, we're letting the women down this year. If we don't put these women, they prove themselves. I mean, we saw them at day of swell rising pipeline and incredibly good sunset beach. And 
I feel like it's almost more of a disservice to the woman to put them out in three to five foot lowers than it is to the men. I want to see the women, and I know the women, Caitlin Simmers, Molly Picklin, these girls are charging. Yeah. Lisa Kerr Johnson is charging. These girls, Tyler Wright's charging. She's surfing better in bigger ways than I've ever seen her surf. They deserve, we as fans deserve to see them. Frankly, I'd like to see them back at Pipeline for the finals. No question about it. Um, speaking of charging, Molly Picklum, her 9.67, I think it was yesterday oh, on a single turn God. at sunset. So she takes off on a closeout. I don't know why, by the way. Um, there's lots of great waves out there. So you'd think you'd just be well, looking for the, here's the Nobody's thing, looking right? for a closeout at sunset. Well, here's the thing. As you know, at sunset, when it's that offshore, you don't really know what's happening down the line. You see a big wall, but yeah. that thing could easily hold up and throw a huge heaving tube, you know? Yeah. And where you, it, there's so much water and like it's, you, you're kind of just don't know. And you see a beautiful blue wall and you're like, I'm going, you know, like I don't think she went, oh, close out. I'm going to go. No. Well, if you do see the close out coming at you, once you're up and riding, you kick out or you straighten out actually at sunset. She went up into the lip went for the turn and then you see it all kind of dropping out underneath her. Anybody would have not even approached that turn. And then anybody would have ejected off of that turn. She went for it and somehow adjusted coming down the face and recovered and got a single, I mean, it could have been a 10. I think, you know, a couple of judges might've given it a 10 actually, but it was like a high nine for a single turn at sunset on a closeout. And in the post heat interview, strider in the water even said to her he's like none of my friends would have even attempted a turn on that wave so that when we say charging it's not just charging into big barrels at pipeline it's going for the end section at sunset you know this is rarefied only andy irons had done this in a previous event it's insane yeah i totally agree uh, and i think maybe tip of the cap to her team too because uh, the judges have let it be known that you can get a one wave excellent score, a, a one turn, excuse me, a one turn excellent score. And they knew that going in. And, and she's like, look, one big Jack Robinson hack, for lack of a better phrase. I think we can we can give Jack the, the you know, we can make that turn called the Jack or whatever. But the Jack Molly Hammer. Pickland, the Jack Hammer. And Molly Pickland performed the Jack Hammer. And frankly, the pickaxe. The what? Say it again. The pickaxe. The pick Molly Picklum pickaxe. Oh, okay, nice. You know, she went into that turn basically going, I'm probably not making this. Like, I think she just went, I'm I'm putting it up. Like, she went for it, but knowing, like, I, you know, this is, this is going to be a tough one. You know, mm -hmm. like, the, the odds are I'm going to fall here. And um, she just kind of went back on her outside rail and it looked like, Oh, and then she made, you know, like it was a free, it was crazy. Everyone saw it. It was mental and hats off to uh, Molly and the pickaxe maneuver. <laughs> um, so no joke, Molly Picklum, we can't overstate kind of the moment that she's having in her career right now. Yeah. The, the 10 point ride at pipeline. And now this result here at sunset with the performance that she delivered at sunset against a bunch of other women kind of hitting their peak. It is, I mean, it's Molly's year. I mean, it was Caitlin's year coming out of that first event, but Molly making it into this final and winning the event. It really is kind of, she is the one to beat as we're going through this season. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see, right. Like you said, we're, as fired up or more fired up for watching the women's because you really sense that there's um legit rivalries there too like you sense that they're all frothing and chomping at the bit like betty lucifer johnson's you know she's pissed like she wants to charge it you know and she's betty trying looks so good man yeah. i hate that she's even not winning these events because i know I she's totally incredible agree. this should be her segment right now but because there's three women that are just absolutely tearing it yeah uh it's yeah it's so it's fascinating it's kind of like mr and shane haran back in my day um so anyway it's, it's well, good stuff the other thing that fits right with this conversation is the changing of the guard like obviously stephanie gilmore and carissa moore opted to sit out for the season but 
this might have been well, happening even if they were on tour. And Tyler Wright is getting trounced by these girls, even last year's world champ. I mean, Caroline's in the conversation still. She's making heats, but this is a whole new guard, and they look un unbeatable. I know. Isn't it strange that like Tati West and Carolyn Marks seem like like old veterans, you know, totally. but they're not really. But this new guards just like move over, you know, like we're here and we're not moving, you know, we're like deal with it. Yeah, exactly. They're totally stealing the spotlight. Um, the other real story that's kind of emerging here, we will discuss kind of individual rides as we go through, but the other story that's emerged after two events is Brazilian Storm has completely dissipated. Um, the Brazilian Storm had been dominant for 10 years. The, the top ranking Brazilian right now is in 13th position. There's no Brazilians in the top 12, and that is Italo. Gabe, uh, Yago's in 17th. Miggy Poops is in 17th. Um, and then below the mid-year cut currently is Gabriel Medina and Samuel Pupo. So that's shocking. That is. That's That doesn't seem right. They... All those surfers you mentioned usually have strong performances in Hawaii. They're, they're worthy of great performances in Hawaii. They've had them in the past. And, you know, it's funny. When we listened to Conor O'Leary yesterday on the podcast, on the broadcast, he was kind of talking about, hey, I had a bad season last year in Hawaii. I think I had a 17th and a last or whatever. And, and he came back and did okay the back half of the season. So there's plenty of time for them to come back and have their moment. And I'm sure that they will. Um, uh, you know, I'm more about, let's just hope there's good waves. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, no kidding, Scott, but I just hope there's not marginal conditions for these events coming up. Well, Gabriel Medina is the storyline up in that Brazil conversation for me, him having two 17ths is shocking. And he notoriously kind of, um, wins his titles in the back half of the season, but two 17ths out of the first two events is got to be rattling even for him those are throwaways you know yeah i'm pretty sure those are throwaways i heard him talking the mindset of the competitor these days is like everything except the ninth and beyond is a throwaway if you're going for the world title you know? Absolutely. i'm not talking about making the cut i'm talking about the world title so interestingly every year for the last 10 years when you and i or discussing the upcoming season right before it starts we've always had a conversation about jordy smith and it used to, 10 years ago it was like is this year jordy's year to win a title and within the last three years the conversation transitioned to is this the year he quits is this year that he doesn't make the cut you know you this is the first year we did not discuss jordy and now he's having his best season ever <laughs> i didn't even know he was on tour i thought he had retired <laughs> Watching him in the pipe event, I was like, wow, Jordy, really? This is like his best start to a season. Good for him. And then watching him at sunset, I'm realizing, oh, my gosh, this is a return to form for Jordy. Obviously, uh, quality waves benefit Jordy greatly. And the style of surfing that he does, especially at sunset, is really reserved only for big blokes. Um, but it's amazing to see him still you know, level up to the current performances that are going down and also like delivering when he needs to deliver. Cause that's been his crux in the past is he'll get into a, he'll have a couple of good heats and then he ends up in the quarters against somebody who he could easily smash and he doesn't put two waves together. So it's incredible. I think to see Jordan and now he's in fourth position. Yeah. You know, he said something in a post heat interview after he beat John Florence in the semifinals or was it at the quarters anyway, when he beat John, John and he basically the 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 young lady i forget her name she's really good um alec athlete. aj mccord aj mccord she does a great job she asked him something and and he basically started answering and he's and then he kind of stopped himself and he's like look it's not that serious like let's just have a little bit of fun like i, I you know and that's the mentality that jordy needs to have if he can maintain that i'm just here to have i've been on tour for so long i'm just enjoying it i think that's what he said he goes look why not enjoy it good and and I think when he's kind of has that letting go moment, you know, that Kelly Slater just let go of all the stuff and go out there and have a good time surfing. Obviously that's when he does his best. If he can maintain that mentality throughout the year. Great. But if he's in third place going into the lowers, at, you know, the final day, can he, you know, with all that pressure mounting, can he still be 
you know what? I'm just going to have fun with it. Whatever happens, happens. If that's the mentality he keeps, he's in a great place. I think he has a lot to offer. Um, his style of surfing is still unique and different than everybody else's. And it's wonderful to see him. Uh, like if you imagine him in a top five scenario, like we had last year, you're like, oh, wow, Ethan Ewing really brings something unique that nobody else has this really polished rail game, you know, and then Felipe has something that's really unique in this scenario. I think Jordy has that as well, where I want to see him kind of go toe to toe with Ethan Ewing to see who can deliver the more exciting performance. I want to see him go toe to toe with Gabriel Medina. He has all of those. He can hit a home run in every category of surfing, no matter what the waves are doing. He's actually won at lowers in the past. He's won in Rio in the past. He's a threat in big waves, you know? So I really hope that he maintains this kind of level of performance throughout the season. Cause I would love to see him in lowers and I believe he could beat almost anybody in lowers. Yeah, I agree too. I, it, you know, I think about the two big lefts on tour the, at Cloud Break, and I guess Chopu is not on tour this year because of the Olympics, right? So it's I think on, of, yeah, it's on tour. Oh, it is it? Is it? Yeah. Okay. I thought maybe they took it off because of the Olympics. Okay. But so Chopu and Cloud Break, that's kind of where we like, I mean, not that he can't have great performances and he has had great performances, but it's not what we think of when we think of Jordy. We think of, oh, he's going to rip Jay Bay, or right. he's going to rip Margaret River, he's going right. to rip Sunset Beach. And part of it is, you know, another thing about Jordy, if I may, is that I was speaking with Barton Lynch a couple of months ago or whatever on a podcast, and we were he was telling, hey, man, the two hit excellent score eight is way better than the seven hit soft little rampy thing at Bells or whatever. Like, and so I think that judging is kind of and, and Jack Robinson kind of helps to solidify that kind of mentality or that theme that the judges have that if you just give me one or two massive hacks a la Jordy or Jack that's just as good as six other little turns that somebody else might do you know mm -hmm. uh, Kanoa you know um, well, so <clears throat> yeah I'm gonna make your point but use the exact opposite surfer huh mm -hmm. there was a heat with Kanoa and Jor Jordy and it might have been the opening exchange and Jordy got a long, soft wave. Yeah. And he did a couple of, you know, it was his opening ride, I believe. And he did yeah. a bunch of shoulder, sh turns out on the shoulder and got like a five-point ride. Cano was on the next wave and it was a running kind of fast, almost like a closeout. So he's like pumping, pumping, pumping. And then he does one turn and got a bigger score for doing the single turn. So to make your point and Barton's, the difference on those two waves was one was a more thrilling wave. Even though Kanoa only did one turn on it, you could see all of the energy on that wave and you could see Kanoa having to go really fast and fit a powerful turn into a fast, uh, imposing section. So that's why one turn gets a lot of, it's exciting to watch that. You watch Jordy and you go, it's very competent surfing, but there's low energy, you know? And so that's how I those things that. get judged. I, I love agree. the term, the term you just used thrilling. It was, it was spot on. I think that's uh, something that we should focus more on as we go through the year and watch these guys, which ride is thrilling. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where these one turn wonders, sometimes two turns are better than five soft roundhouses. Yeah, exactly. So I'm down with that. Um, the, so I guess we have to talk about survival league, unfortunately, <laughs> going into this event. I, uh, I told you my pick was Baron Baron lost. I'm out of survival league, but going into the event, I honestly had Jordy in my mind because of that pipeline performance. I was like, you know, Baron's the obvious pick. I'm not going to use Baron throughout the rest of the season, but Jordy, he's looking good. Like he's one out here in the past and he's looking good coming out of pipe. And I just opted against it. But in my gut, I almost knew that I should have picked Jordy. And then watching this event unfold, I really, really wanted to kick myself. Yeah. I haven't received my, um, you lost email. You're a, you're a loser email from the survival league folks, but I lost as well. I had Leo Fiero Avanti. 
Wow. And he had a great heat. He was almost like he was, it was one of those buzzer beaters. That was a risky pick, man. I don't know. I, I, I looked at it like, like that's an under the radar one that Leo serves great in big sunset. Like I could see Leo in the semifinals, you know, like I, I didn't feel like it was risky. I, I felt like, you know, there's going to be 16 guys or whatever that, or eight guys, or what well, is it? Sixteen? Yeah, there'll be six. He'll be one of the sixteen that gets through. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so demoralizing to lose in survival <laughs> league. It is like you're like I had five picks that I was vying between. Four of them made it through. I picked the one that didn't. It's and it's event number two. Like I, I cannot know. get past a couple of events in survival league every year. I don't know what my best performance is. It's probably not past the third event of the season. Yeah. It's hard. It, that's why it's it makes it so, so much, hard. It makes it really fun. You yeah. Know, I mean, if you're still in it, you're, you're really geeking out. And I don't know how many are still in it. I bet, I bet with Baron, we lost quite a few guys because you and I were kind of pimping Baron beforehand. I think they even survival league even said in an Instagram that Baron was the most picked surfer of sunset. Oh. I think I could be wrong about that. And that's amazing. In two events where we've cut the, the field, like to about probably, I don't know, 80% is probably the cut. Yeah, I bet you're right. Cause the first event 56% uh, lost out in the first event. So that brought it down to 44 immediately. Um, so the other kind of highlight performances here, of course, Jack Robinson, multiple, multiple time winner at this event. Um, I mean, this, if you look at sunset and you kind of think, Oh, who do I associate with sunset? John, John Florence was in my conversation at the top of my head prior to this event, but coming out of the event, Jack Robinson is now in that number one position. I feel like this, it, this is his venue. He's the guy to yeah. beat at sunset at this point, his style of surfing, obviously is um power based his prowess to find the barrel out there is really unmatched i mean he he ends up in the waves that he does get barreled on anybody else would get up and look for that barrel and find the barrel and come out of it but he's doing a big turn and then adjusting somehow like there's a lot of ground to cover but he's able to kind of project out of a bottom turn coming off of a big top turn into the tube fitting into fitting in turns and then on that wave that he surfed in the final got a second barrel somehow you know so just the amount of ground that he covers um it's almost like somebody surfing lowers or some or snapper or something like multiple turns into the tube and then coming out and doing it again at sunset it's incredible yeah he's a name you know as you look back in history uh as a fan and not being a guy that lives there and knows all the guys that are out in the water there every day but just sort of a, a broad overview we think of, or I think of like, well, there's names that you associate with Sunset Beach, as you mentioned. And so there's like Jeff Hack. Like I associate Jeff Hack with Sunset Beach. I associate Ian Cairns with Sunset Beach. Obviously, Barry Kanaya Pooney is probably the number one name you associate with Sunset Beach. And then as you go through the history, you know, maybe, um, you know, there's some other guys that I'm like Gary Kong Elkerton kind of comes to mind from a competitive standpoint. Miles Padaka has done really well out there. Sonny Garcia. And then you get to John John and you get to Jack Robinson. And he's in that conversation of like, it looks like he's married, married to Sunset. In many ways, it's kind of the way Jamie O'Brien or Kelly is at Pipeline is the way Jack surfs sunset beach like it's he's just on a on an ethereal level with that wave it's a it's really kind of special to watch um i think we have to give credit as well to eric arakawa and the boards that he makes for jack robinson yeah. because like i said the amount of ground that he covers but also with like the lightning fast twitch adjustments you know to like snap into the tube or whatever it's he's surfing sunset a different way than every other person that you mentioned leading up to this and it is largely cap he's largely capable of doing that because of the boards covering that amount of ground and the projection that you get the speed that you can carry 
um, through, you know, the softer sections of the wave carrying speed through that and then having maneuverability in addition to the projection drive that he's getting out of it. It's just really uh, quite the combo. And I know he's obviously been working with Eric Arakawa for over a decade now since Jack was really young on boards for Hawaii, but he is a sharp eye team rider. So he's fine tuning his sharp eye pointy thrusters for almost any other venue on tour. But then with an agreement, probably with sharp eye saying, Hey, when I go to Hawaii, I got to ride my Arakawas. And this is precisely why like that wave requires a very specialized surfboard and they've been working on it for a decade. Yeah, it's interesting because now, you know, we look at how Jack does for the rest of the year on tour with sort of a keener eye on how his boards are performing. And especially as you and I um, digest Stab in the Dark and we watch how Kalohe is adapting to different boards. I mean, we, if one thing that's interesting about Stab in the Dark is that it's helped me to have a more discerning eye when I really watch the water flow off of these boards and and where they're um, maybe stuck in the middle of a bottom turn or whatever the case may be, you know? Um, so I, it'll be interesting to see how the, um, how Jack performs on the sharp eyes, making the jump, you know, and of course, you know, he has history of doing great on him. So it'll be fun to watch. Let's talk about stab in the dark. I mean, we can come back to sunset if things, you know, if you're reminded of certain things, but are you ready to discuss stab in the dark? Cause some of what you said, I would love to break. Yeah. Let, break me, down. let me take a break and um, we'll come back and talk. Okay. Sounds good. Scott Bass, we are about to talk about Stab in the Dark with Chloe Andino, and so many of those surfboards that he rides in this series are available at realwatersports.com. Heck yeah. And you know what else is available? The Ryan Sakel Saber. So those boards, and I'm not sure which one's trip carries at real of those ones, it probably carries Pizel. Right. I don't want definitely. to say. Yeah, definitely lost. Definitely. Which of Channel those Islands. ones? Okay. Which of, go ahead and give me the list of the ones that Real Water Sports carries that you know of that were on the stab in the dark. Um, I well, I can't I can't say for certain, but a bunch of them. Okay. Half of them at least. <laughs> okay. Well, wait, I know for certain that the Ryan Sakel Saber, yeah, you can yeah. get at Real Water Sports. And look, Christensen's uh, Maurice Calls, a bunch of boards. Unreal selection of surfboards from Trip and the crew at Real Water Sports. So make sure you um, go there, check out what they got. And David, fill me in now. If I'm just like last minute Larry guy and I need a board shipped to me, what do they do there at Real Water Sports regarding shipping? Well, the entire shipping business has kind of an economies of scale to it. And so the more that you ship, the better rates that you get. You know, they've they buy all the shipping materials in bulk so they get that stuff for cheap so they're able to ship surfboards for one low flat fee anywhere on the planet they're shipping experts as much as they are experts on anything water sport related they're experts on shipping and so trip told me a story a while back about there was a guy in indo on a boat trip who broke his quiver of boards that he had brought ordered from Real Water Sports, Real Water Sports was able to deliver them to his boat in Indonesia before the end of his trip, a brand new quiver of surfboards. So if you live somewhere in a home, in a residential area, no problem. They'll get it to your door and they actually guarantee it to show up blemish free, which you don't get that guarantee if you buy Somewhere else, you might walk out to your car and drop it on the ground. That's not showing up at your house blemish-free. This will show up at your door blemish-free. So pretty incredible. That's cool. Maybe, maybe they'll be shipping to El Salvador. You know? <laughs> <Who knows? laughs> maybe. So realwatersports.com. Okay. <clears throat> Stab in the Dark, Episode 3 with Chloe and Dino. I'm going to go out there and just say, I think this was the single best episode of Stab in the Dark that I've ever witnessed. Wow. Didn't we say that last week? <laughs> Gets better each time. I said, I, I definitely said this is the best um, season that they've done or installment that they've done, but maybe you're right. Maybe I did say it was the best episode previously. I really felt that to be true on this episode. I totally agree. And, and it, it started out great. Um, but really the highlight was when Pizel joined the fray mm -hmm. 
and um, he started talking about, you know, the different vagaries of surfboard design and all the different ones. And they asked him to, to, they gave him a shot at picking which boards were made by who. And that was a lot of fun and fascinating to watch. Yeah, really was. Cause there's so much little, little things that he's saying that, that are just from a surfer, uh, you know, from an end user of a, a surfboards, it's, it's kind of fun to listen to, you know, somebody that's so knowledgeable and, um, you know, his topic about can't making, you know, making the magic board, you can't make it. You and I have had that discussion numerous times and he just kind of did a better job of reiterating all of yeah. those little things about why a magic surfboard is, is impossible to replicate. So to break it down for people who don't have stab premium, um, they're filming this in, uh, in Bali and Paisel happens to spend months out of the year there, summer months, basically. And so he happened to be there while they were filming and, um, you know, they crossed paths. And so they incorporated him into the edit and the storyline. And then they said, you know, without Kaloe, Paisel, come over to the house and look at all the surfboards. A, try to pick your surfboard. B, try to identify the other shapers. And then C, try to pick a winner. Who, Which of these boards do you think is going to win? He opted to not, you know, he said, my board's going to win, basically. Um, but the interesting thing was he identified his own surfboard within seven seconds. Out of the 12 boards on the rack, he instantly, they go, okay, stopwatch, boom. He scans them all real quick, grabs one, looks at the tail, goes, boom, this is it. And they're like, yep, that's it. Um, and what was more interesting about that is he didn't even shape that board. So Paisel obviously lives in Hawaii, but he has production set up in different places in the world, one of which is California. And so he has a shaper, DJ Kane, who builds those boards in California, shapes those boards for him in California. Obviously, they're coming off of files that are cut on a machine, and then the shaper finishes the uh, the pre-cut down to John's exacting specs. But the fact that John obviously knows his specs that well and that dj can replicate the boards to john's specifications so much so that he can pick it up off a rack in bali and identify it is pretty incredible i mean i would yeah, expect that... him to be able to do it but it's very impressive yeah it was it was it was neat that, that he was just able to boom seven seconds ago this is it boom and he said it was such conviction and confidence and he was of course correct and um, can we just talk a little bit about DJ Kane? Because that guy has made me some incredible surfboards over the years. I'm such a big fan of his. And it made me realize, like, I was almost like, God, I need to. I, I've actually tried to order a board. And he's like, oh, I'm so busy right now with the Pizels. I, You know, like, he just gets swamped. But he made me a board called the Swordfish that I rode for years. It was an incredible four fin. And I just absolutely love that board. It was probably 15 years ago or 10 years ago that I had that board. But um that's one of those ones where you're like, oh, I wish I still had that board. You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe I should just call him a good one. But DJ Kane, Dennis, he's a great, obviously a great shaper in his own right. Um, so yeah, you can get Pizel's, you know, California Pizel is going to be shaped by him. And um, or well, you just, yeah, order one from, from if you can get lucky. It's Harborside Glassing is in Oceanside is where, is where Dennis, uh, where DJ Kane works out of. I'm requesting a DJ Kane boardroom podcast. Yeah, a good idea. I, okay. I that's a great idea. That's a great idea for sure. So, so yes, John Pizel's phenomenal addition to the conversation in Stab in the Dark. But the other detail prior to him coming on screen that really made me fall in love with this episode, and I think was an improvement even on the previous versions, was there are many documentaries within the episode on the individual board builders and how they came to be. And they have been doing this before. I think they've gotten better and better at it. Whoever's writing the story, researching the backstory, and then the way that they edit it, the archival photos and footage that they get is incredible. Um, so, you know, uh, Timmy Patterson, for example, rewind all the way to Walter Hoffman, then to... Timmy's. His, his grandfather, Timmy's grandfather. Yeah, was exactly. in the Navy and was taking balsa out of life rafts that they were decommissioning. And he was taking that and 
building surfboard blanks out of it. Yeah. So providing that level of history and storytelling within a very compact 90 seconds, like I said, it's a mini documentary. It's surf history documentary in the middle of these episodes. And so I thought back to how they've done it in the past, how they help, help shapers tell their stories about the boards that the surfer is riding. And they've done it through interviews at times with the surfboard shaper. But I realized it's actually more effective storytelling to do it the way that they're doing it in this episode. Like to have somebody research it and have a narrator tell the story and show all this archival footage and imagery with it is like incredibly insightful. I like to also hear the interviews with the shapers, but I just think this is a more thorough, concise way of doing yeah, it. That's concise, yeah. And then, so I loved all that. And then to have the access to Pizel to kind of come through from the shaper's perspective, yeah. get the full interview, break down his perspective on all of these things was, you know, icing on the cake, basically. Depth to this episode that other episodes have not achieved. And then the surfing was, you know, top level. Like Kolohe's surfing in this episode, he surfed a couple of great uh, days, like where the waves were really good. And so seeing him kind of light it up was made it the most well-rounded, complete episode, I feel. Um, what was the number one thing that you learned from this episode? It's mm. a trick question. A trick question. I don't know. What was the number one thing you learned from this episode? I did not ever associate Joel Tudor with Timmy Patterson and Longboard, a world title. Phenomenal. In 2004, Joel Tudor won a world title on a Timmy Patterson Longboard. I've never heard of that, ever. Yeah. You know, that's amazing. That's not something that you would put together. Yep. That was a phenomenal tidbit of information. It was. I was blown away by that. I was like, wow, I can't believe I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I can't believe Joel's never mentioned that. And I'm sure he has. I just haven't spoken with him about it. But I've heard, you know, you think of Joel, you think of Donald Doggy Armour, you think of Joel Tudor surfboard, you think of, you know, like a bunch of old school Santa Cruz, uh, San Diego guys, you know, Bizak, whoever. But you don't think of Timmy Patterson. No. Um, the other history lesson that they gave us was Hayden. Cox. Yeah. And it made me realize, man, Hay Hayden has really been maligned um, and painted unfairly, I think, with a kind of, he gets discounted by, I don't know, a lot of, I don't know, course well, here's the thing, conversation like, there's, because there's, of the model that he, the industrialized surfboard model that he is, uh, you know, used to grow his business. But he is an incredible guy. You know, like it's, it's so impressive what he's done with his business and his brand. I think what happens with Hayden a little bit is that tall poppy syndrome, mm. especially in Australia, where if like you get real successful, you get cut down. Yeah. And I think that Hayden is just so successful that he's easy. He's an easy target. He's easy fodder. It's easy to cut down that poppy and make him try to make him the, the same height as everybody else. And, um, and, you know, that's unfortunate because he's obviously a very talented young, or at this point, he's a, just a normal age guy. Normal age. What's Everyone normal seems age? young to me. Everyone seems, <laughs> you seem young. Everyone seems like Groms, you know? Dude, just as a side note real quick, Lauren's yeah. into The Bachelor. And uh -huh. I'm, I'm watching it over her shoulder the other night. And I go, when was this show like featuring kids? You know, like I thought The Bachelor was like adults that were dating. This is like children dating. And she's like, no, it's always been the same age people. They're like in their mid 20s. You got old, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I'm like, I remember watching The Bachelor and it was like full grown. Oh, there's an attorney. There is a doctor. There is a nurse, whatever teacher. They're full grown adults. I'm looking at it now going, what did they just get out of high school? It's crazy. <laughs> And they're acting like high schoolers. Why are they all so stupid? Um, anyways, <laughs> get that's off neither of here my lawn. There. Yeah, there's neither here nor there. Anyways, Hayden, I I don't to be perfectly honest, I don't think I ever formed an opinion about Hayden. And I have a feeling there's some people listening going, There's a reason I don't like Hayden, and it's well justified, you know, or whatever. All I know is coming out of this, I am very impressed by what he has built and um 
his work ethic, obviously, he's incredibly smart. He's obviously talented in a variety of ways, but it was just very impressive to get that little history lesson. So I appreciated that. And I think too with Hayden, and I don't know him or uh, his wife, but I think that his wife probably, you know, with every great man, there's a greater woman behind him type of thing. And I think she probably drives a lot of initiatives that we don't know about. And so um, without knowing that, I'm going to say hats off to Danielle for being a big part of, I think, his success. I reached out years and years ago for a podcast interview. And I got an email back from her and she was like, hey, we would appreciate any support in any way. Um, have you read his book? I think it's called New Wave Vision mm -hmm. or New Wave or something. And mm -hmm. I'm like, no. And she goes, I'm going to send you a copy. Just the only thing that I would ask is before we do the podcast interview is that you just read the book. I was like, okay, sweet. So she sent me the book and then I didn't read it. And so I never followed up for the interviews. But, but wow. I, but I, that's my fault, but I it's appreciate not like you. Well, you know, whatever. I had a million things to do and probably a bunch of other interviews that happened, came yeah. together in quick succession. And I, I mean, I will do it eventually in the future. I think he'd Were be you a put phenomenal. off that she put a, no, put no, no, no. The exact opposite. I was impressed. I was like, yeah. you should make the interviewer jump through a, there's, they probably get hit up by a bunch of half-assed interviewers starting up a podcast or something. And Hayden can't take 90 minutes out of his day to do all of those, you know? So all that you have to do is create one hoop for the interviewer to jump through that will at least position them better to actually conduct the interview. And that's a perfect hoop to jump through. I think it was yeah. totally reasonable, but yeah. I, I agree with everything you're saying is that she was, it was, she's great. You know, like that proved to me like, oh, wow, she's invested in this. She is, um, you know, operating on the behalf of the business and yeah. fantastic. I'm all for it. Yeah, totally agree. So, so yeah. Um, well, unfortunately he didn't like the, uh, Kaloi didn't necessarily like the Hayden and, um, he went through that pretty quick, which I was surprised by. I watched him on the Hayden and I thought he looked good and there was moments of like bogging or whatever, but I thought there was moments of brilliance in it as well. So I expected him to come in and say, I need to surf this again, maybe in different conditions. And I was shocked when he came in and just denied it. Yeah, there were a few boards where it just looked like they didn't have the quickness, the instant speed that Kalohe seems to demand, what he calls drive, which I would call more like, I mean, drive's a fine word for it, but that, Feeling where as soon as you get up, you've got the speed you need, that you don't have to do anything to get the speed going so that now you can perform maneuvers. And that board and a few other boards looked like they didn't have what Kalohe was deeming to be drive. Right. Uh, well, there's a couple more eliminations. The final is set up for March 5th, episode number four, and the four surfboards that made it into the final. Fucus, DHD, Patterson, and Borst. I'm psyched. So knowing what we know, that there was a sense of astonishment, perhaps, or surprise, I guess, would be a better way to say it, based on the very first episode where they they have Chloe talking to his dad and they bleep out the winner and they basically say, wow, can you believe it? Or something along those lines. Um, as if they were surprised makes you think what Borst, right? Like who's the winner here? Who, like, if you're going to, based on what I, the, you've seen too. Um, it's, it, it's, you're right. It's super interesting. And this is an ongoing conversation with us since episode one, but it could be Patterson. Like I said, last week. Well, here's what's weird. I feel like the Puka sport, we didn't see a whole lot. Like he just kind of wrote it and he loved it. And he goes, that's it. And they've shelved it for three episodes. I feel like that one hasn't been, I almost feel like he hasn't had enough time on it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But who knows? Like, it's going to be fun to watch what happens. Um, so you think it's Timmy. I don't, I mean, I really don't feel strongly about it, but I think that an argument could be made again, he doesn't know what a blowout is. He used the term blowout, and that's what we were focused on for the first couple of episodes. Um, none of these would be a blowout. And yeah. so, but I but I do think that he could have been referring to the fact that, like I said, maybe his dad rode Timmy's back in the day. Timmy and 
Biolis, which is Kaloe's lifelong shaper, are live across, yeah. you know, work across the alley from one another, essentially. Yeah. And so there's kind of that hometown, like, oh, this is crazy. The neighbor of my lifelong shaper won. And it's a board that my dad wrote. I think that could be maybe what he's pointing at. Mm. But the Borst, yeah. you're right. The Borst would be very interesting if that was the winner, too. Well, I mean, they all looked good. The Borst looked super loose. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, yeah. You know, he surfed so good. They all looked pretty good. It was easy to see the boards that he didn't like. It was more difficult for me to go which ones are is he really excited about and um i almost feel like he was sort of eliminating boards based on you know it was easier for him to go i definitely don't like this one rather than oh all the upside of this one there was a few boards early on where it's like this one absolutely i think it was the dhd that he's absolutely in love with number 22 mm. if you recall yeah, that's a couple right. episodes ago he's like this one's in the final guaranteed for sure yep yep, yep. you're right well, I'm excited. I love this series. It is well worth my uh, whatever amount that I spend on Stab Premium, seven bucks a month or something like that. Um, yeah. There was a couple of other surf events this past week that I thought I saw them kind of advertised in advance. I thought they're cool local events. And then they delivered incredible surf. One was the Thrilla at Killa's, which is the big wave event um, in Baja. And then the other one was Capitulu Perfetto, which is a super tubos event in Portugal, um, running in a beach, the beach break barrel barreling spot. They got phenomenal waves for that event. Rob Machado is kind of an, I think it's an invite, um, event. I think it might be the first annual even, but I had somebody, one of our listeners sending me information on it for the last month or two, like, Hey, this event's coming up. We're going to get some super cool people. It's going to be an amazing local event. And they ran in phenomenal surf. It seems like it ran in one day. Uh, the finals, Ballerum Stack made the final. Dylan Graves made the final. Rob Machado made the final. It was won by a local kid whose name is um, Tiago Stock, I think is his name. Little, but to for a local kid to get those guys in the final and then win first prize over all of them was just an amazing finish that's, to that that's event. That's really cool. So What's I don't know. Uh, Capitolo Perfetto. So Portuguese event, and then the thriller. Well, I'm trying to pull it up here. So yeah, the thriller at Killers. Uh, Cody Purcell won in the men's division, and Katie McConnell won in the women's division. And it seemed again like they got incredible waves there. And Paige Alms served in the event. Bianca Valenti served in the event. I saw JoJo Roper get a wave in the event. Um, so. Kind of cool to see these local homegrown specialty events popping up, not popping up, but they've always been there, but um, there's always been versions of them, but they scored. Hmm. Well, anyway, I'm trying to find it here, but can't seem to find it. Anyway. It exists. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it does. I'm just wondering if, oh, okay. I just pulled it up. Here's the finalist. With Rob and Dylan, and this kid's just psyched, you know? And he's like 23, and they're 40. I know. <laughs> um, rad to see Rob, though, traveling to an event and also getting shacked when he gets there. Yeah, super cool. Um, one follow-up from last week, you were talking about the Orca, or I guess it might have been two weeks ago, the Orcas um, off the coast of one of your local peers, I forget which. Yeah. And then, and then I was like, have orcas ever eaten anybody or, you know, like what is the actual threat with an orca when you're confronted like that? And somebody chimed, Jared chimed in and he said, there are no records of orcas eating humans. And I believe only known attacks have been in captivity. Good for them. Uh, it seems like they don't have any interest in attacking us, but are territorial or protective with attacks on boats off the coast of Europe. Either way, it would still probably be pretty freaky to see one if you were out there. And I'd much rather, but I'd much rather see an orca than a shark. Keep up the great work. Thanks, Jared. Wow. All right, Jared, coming through it. As you know, um, I did an interview with Kyle Knox. It's in the latest boardroom podcast that'll probably be live in a little couple of days or whatever. Um, 
And we talk about the encounter that they had, the adventure that they had off of La Jolla with a pod of orcas. And it was quite thrilling and exhilarating and scary. And um, I don't know, orcas, because of their intelligence, um, I'm kind of freaked out. Plus, I think because I watched Blackwater, was that the documentary where one of the orcas like <laughs> dismembers a SeaWorld <laughs> trainer? No, I don't mean to laugh. It's not funny, but. <laughs> yeah Sad. yeah and that was like he said the only attacks have been in captivity and it seems to be out of um spite it was that one orca ticklum i think was its name there was an orca oh, okay. named ticklum okay. or something like that that was like angry you know yeah. angry orca yeah well being in yeah. captivity will do that to you yeah but that's yeah. what you're talking about with the intelligence you know there's a lot of um uh, I don't know, less cognitively developed animals that were be happy to be in captivity, let's say, presumably, but yeah, <laughs> they're happy to have the shelter from their predators and a constant food source, but right. orcas seem to be intelligent enough to know that that's not their best life. So yeah, let's get out of there. Um, sure. well, so I was looking at this, this, um, event in Portugal that you brought up. Yeah. And there's all of these competitors. There's like the surf stars. There's like national champions from Portugal. There's young guns. And then there's one other little category that they put and they just call it a um, wild card. And there's only one guy and it's Tiago stock. The guy that won, like there's all these different layers and you go to the bottom of the website and there's one guy, Tiago stock. And he was the winner. Well, specifically, I didn't mention this. He surfed through the trials event. I guess they had a trials event. So he won access via that wild card entry by winning an event and then went on to win the main event. So it's really a story. Oh, that's so cool. And the waves, like you said, are firing. Go check out capitulopurfieto.com. Capitulopurfieto.com. And you check out the videos. They got the, the waves were firing. It's like super clean heaving barrels i guess it was at super tubos yeah it's incredible super cool event yeah where's the killer well i have a must-see moment for you and it's brought to you by trees wax that's right thank you petroleum free surf wax can you imagine that made from rocks and trees oh my god good wax good for the environment what's not Tr like treeswax.com lots of local retailers have it but you can grab a bar a box at uh, treeswax.com must see moment. Gary Kong Elterton, 1987, best ever at Sunset Beach. This is from Real Surf Stories on YouTube. Video was just posted a few days ago, uh, five days ago. It's got 50,000 views. Quote from the man himself, Gary Kong Elterton, quote, if you couldn't compete in Hawaii, you were a nobody, end quote boom yeah that's there's no doubt about that and that's what it should be so surf photographer and filmmaker um tony roberts from santa cruz california is behind that that uh youtube account tr tr real surf stories oh that's cool and tr so tr has been filming surfing since early 80s and um has it all archived and then also has been traveling the world doing that, you know, so he he's interacted with all of these people and he has a real passion for storytelling. And so he was doing a podcast for a little while. I don't think he does it anymore, but I think he's really found a perfect medium with YouTube doing these little documentaries. And he has a passion for, you know, um, like in the conversation that we're having about Felipe Toledo, let's say in Hawaii and sunset, it's like, he knows, oh my gosh, there's an important moment. And it was 1987 with Kong and I have footage of this and I know the story. And so he's taking the time to document surf history. He's already taking the time to do that. Now he's taking the time to tell it with the context of modern day. And so it's really amazing. I think so this video, um, he does some narration, like he wrote a script, does the narration, but then posts all of the, much like the stab piece that I was talking about, posts imagery 
to provide the context, then posts his footage from Sunset from 1987 throughout it with little interstitials with uh, interviews with Gary Kong Elter Elkerton. So this is an eight minute video. I will post it on surfsplendorpodcast.com with today's show. And uh, yeah, it's just a great little piece of surf history, a mini documentary. I love it. I love it. And Tony's about my age. So we kind of went through the same stuff as kids, like the stuff that was important to us in the surf culture space. And I'm going to, I don't know if he has done this one yet, but I'm going to ask Tony to do one for us. And you and I spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, but there was an event in 1986, the Billabong Pro, and it moved from Sunset Beach to Waimea Bay. And a bunch of professional surfers just did not paddle out. And in light of, um, you know, Sunset and Hawaii being the most important place for surfing, it would be cool if TR could do one of these on that event, that moment. Um, you know, I know Mark Richards has, has spoken about it at length and, um, like, let's find out what happened that day. Not, I guess that's kind of weird. Like, I don't want to necessarily shame somebody for not paddling out a huge wine man, but it's a fascinating part of surf history. And um, on some level, I don't think we should just bury it, you know, like it, because it, it, it coincides or it contrasts with the Smirnoff at Waimea when Fred Hemmings is like, look, we're going out, we're having this contest. And if you guys are afraid, I'm going to put on a, a jersey right now and paddle out and show you that this can be done. Yeah. And and he went out and did that. So you can kind of like, you know, fast forward to 12 years, Hawaii May Bay, this one time, and all of a sudden the same thing's happening. Competitors are going, I don't know, man. And it's on. Randy Rarick's going, we're going. Yeah. And uh, it'd be, it'll be a fun, it might be a fun one for surf fans to watch. I agree. That's phenomenal. So this, ep or this, uh, video that I just mentioned. It's part of an ongoing kind of series that he is doing on his YouTube channel called Days That Changed Surfing. And he gives you the exact date with each of the videos. And I'll just tell you some of the previous ones. Days That Changed Surfing, Potts versus uh, Tom Curran at Holly Eva. Um, Days That Changed Surfing, July 20th, 1885 the first surfers ever in the U S days that changed surfing July 21st, 1984, J Bay, Mark Ocalupo, um, Kelly Slater, bud tour, 1990, September 9th. So lots of really cool moments. How in about history. this one? How Bob McTavish, George Greeno, and Nat Young changed surfing forever. Of course we're honoring Bob McTavish. I just had a phone call with him yesterday at the boardroom show in October, everyone can come out and meet Bob McTavish. He's the greatest guy, such a wonderful, uh, gregarious and engaging personality. And uh, if you want to meet a guy that changed surfing forever, the boardroom show in October, um, yeah. plug, 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 but yeah, TR great work on these real surf stories. I just subscribed to his YouTube channel. I didn't even know it existed and I'm yep. so stoked. I'm going to take a peek at all of these and, um, Probably, they're really, probably they're really cool. pull some information out of them for my own needs. Yeah, great idea. Yeah, that video um, that you were just referencing, the Bob McTavish one, was July 23rd, 1966. So really cool stuff here. Great work, TR. Must-see moment presented by TreesWax.com. Uh, one last thing, and then we'll go. But um, I do have a, a little bit of a weather update. So La Nina is supposed to kick in we're on the tail end of an el nino and la nina is supposed to kick in and according to a uh, chief meteorologist from accuweather jonathan porter the atlantic hurricane season although it doesn't kick off until june 1st there are already serious and growing concerns about the impending atlantic hurricane season the two key factors that have the accuweather forecasting sounding the alarm uh, the return of La Nina, as I mentioned, and historically warm water across the Atlantic Ocean right now. So that current El Nino is fading out. Um, but as Porter explained, um, La Nina typically leading to plenty of storms and hurricanes. And now with um, warm waters, uh, it's, they're expecting a lot of hurricanes. Uh, and that, that even means like in the Texas area down there in the Gulf of Mexico, um, that whole region. So be on the alert. 
Excellent. You know what I need to make a note of, and you can remind me maybe next episode, our listeners who are going to El Salvador with us in April oh, yes. via, via waterwaystravel.com want to know what boards we are preparing to bring for the trip. And then they also want me to put together like a group email for everybody that's going to share the information about what boards everybody else is bringing. That's great. I'm undecided. I saw your beautiful John Simon that you're bringing, right? Yep. And what kind of fin configuration are we talking about? I'm glad you asked. Um, I emailed Jamin and Leif at NBS. I said, hey, <laughs> what do I do here? It's a quad setup and it's asymmetrical. I am completely lost. <laughs> and Going off uh, the grid. Yeah. And Jamie goes, you know what? I'm going to call John, Simon, and we'll figure it out. So I've been out of the conversation and they've oh, been cool. communicating directly. And Jamin followed up with me and he goes, hey, we're just going to make something specific to that board and we'll get it to John. And, um, you know, he can. So I think they're getting it to John. John's going to test it out. Because John has a similar obvious board, you know, model that he's made for me. So he's going to test the fins out on his own and they're going to tweak them probably. And so that's what I'll be writing. <laughs> All right. Well, let me, I've, I've given you this hint before, but you have an asymmetrical surfboard. Why would you have symmetrical fins? And so my point is, if you have a toe side twin fin, put some keels on it. And if you have a heel side quad fin, put some quads on it. And oh, by the way, you might put one of Sean Madison's nubsters in the middle. And I, I've i spoken to you uh, again about this before, but I've had an asymmetrical board that had five completely different fins. And I mean, like some were futures, some were FCSs. Yeah. Yeah, okay. well. I'm going to be, yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm all ears. I'm listening to what you're saying, but I'm also removing myself from the decision making. I'm going to leave it to those guys and see what they come up with. Yeah, that's probably right. smart. You should probably, here's what you should do. Yield to them, then yield to your intuition. And then whatever I say, disregard. Yep. Um, well, that's that's one of the yeah. boards that I'm bringing, but I will. One, bring you're bringing three. more than one? I'm going to bring three boards. Holy shit. Incredible. Go ahead. What else you got? Well, what I don't it? know. I haven't decided on the other ones, but what, you think three's too many for a week? I think one's too many. <laughs> No, one's perfect. I'm bringing one board. Says and the guy with 300 surfboards. I'm bringing one board and it's going to be a Twinser. And I think it's going to be the one Ryan Sakel's making me, but it might be the one Stu Kenson's making me. It just depends on who gets me the board first. I got to try it. I'm not going to take it without trying it. So right okay. now I'm, I know I'm bringing a Twinser as of now. Okay. And if that board gets damaged in transit before we even get there. Yeah. I'll be riding one of yours. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. You know what? I'm not Probably letting be you buying ride it. one of mine. Probably be buying it from you. I'm not letting you ride one of mine. I might bring a foil too. Perfect. There's fewer <laughs> people in the water then. <laughs> There's one fewer <laughs> wave hog out uh, with us. It's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to seeing what the other guys are bringing. Yeah, I'll I'll put that uh, I'll organize that email. Get everybody. I mean, the reality is, I think he asked me a couple of weeks ago because he wanted enough time to order a board. But now I've probably botched that timeline by delaying. But I'll what, try what to about, get back is, on it. Has our every man in the dark surfboard uh, testing thing just fallen away, or we just don't have the energy to pull that off? I still want to do it. I have not had the energy up until now to do it, but I think it's still feasible. We yeah, we just need. We need a video guy that will do the editing work. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's still feasible. We'll work towards it. All right. Well, look, great show, David. Um, until next time, adios and aloha. Aloha.